See, the great thing about science is... Whoa! It's frozen so hard that I can crush it. Now, can you see those droplets? The way you answer the question is by doing the experiment. Isn't this a great World Science Festival? <laughs> About as far back as I have clear memories, I was interested in science. Now I suppose, like most kids, I was interested in everything. So certainly at the age of six, I can remember my parents having given me a microscope and looking at all kinds of stuff uh, from around the house. And as time went on, I kind of made my own chemistry set by collecting uh, household fluids and uh, seeing what would happen when I mixed them together. And then I graduated to more sophisticated, uh, real uh, chemistry sets and erector sets and things like that. And probably by the time I was 10 years old, I was finding that science was the thing that was really dominating my interest compared to all the other things that, uh, that somebody might be interested in. And in fact, even by that age, I was finding that, that I was really drawn to, to physics as opposed to other kinds of sciences, which I was still and continue to be very much interested in. According to the, uh, uh, the legend, one day Galileo was uh, in the cathedral in Pisa. And instead of apparently paying attention to the, uh, the church service, he was watching the chandelier in the cathedral swing back and forth. And Galileo noticed something really, really important. He noticed that as the chandelier would swing back and forth, that it didn't matter whether it was swinging a lot or whether it was just swinging a little. It took the same amount of time to go back and forth. And that inspired people to use a pendulum, something that swings back and forth like this, as the ticker for a clock. Einstein taught us that clocks run at a different rate depending upon uh, how high or low they are in a gravitational field. So a clock very close to the surface of the Earth runs slower than a clock on a mountain. Einstein, time, and the coldest stuff in the universe. So what does Einstein have to do with time? Well, time put Einstein on the cover of their magazine <laughs> as the person of the century. And not a bad choice. I talk about why we need atomic clocks and why atomic clocks are such exceptionally good timekeepers. And then why, because of the way atomic clocks work, why we need to have things be very cold. What is a clock? Well. For me, a clock is something that ticks, something that gives us a periodic set of events. The earliest clock is the rotating Earth. The Earth rotates, ancient people saw the sun rise and set, and they ticked off days. As they became more sophisticated, they made things like sundials, and they ticked off hours. So one of the most common applications of clocks, most common in the sense that it's something that almost everybody benefits from is the operation of the global positioning system. But even if you're not someone who uses it in your, uh, in your own vehicle, you rely on the fact that people who are delivering packages are, um, uh, are using the global positioning system. That when you fly in an airplane, that that airplane is being guided between airports by the global positioning system. And that any number of, uh, of vehicles that are used for civilian and military purposes are uh, relying on the global positioning system. People take them when they go backpacking so they don't get lost in the backcountry. Uh, sometimes golfers even use them to figure out how far they are from the hole and know what club to select. So it's a widely used uh, technology and it depends on having extremely good clocks. Uh, every quartz crystal in every watch is a little bit different from every other one and the ticking rate may change according to the temperature or the humidity or it may change depending upon whether you wear it on your wrist or leave it on a, a table beside your bed. So I think that, that one of the things that um, gets a lot of kids interested in science is from playing with things. They play with things and they, they come to understand that there are interesting things that happen 
in the natural world. They pour a cold drink into a, uh, a glass and they find that there's water on the outside if it's summertime, and if it's winter, there isn't. So an observant child will say, I wonder why that is true. Compared to the liquid nitrogen, this thing is red hot. Imagine that you took a metal bucket and heated it up in a fire until it was glowing red and then poured cold water into it. What would happen? Well, what would happen is the water would boil and that's what's going on here. Don't try this at home. Well, I've always found that when you use liquid nitrogen that it is uh, exciting and appealing to young people. And uh, so I want to make science as exciting and as appealing as possible to young people. So I like to use a lot of liquid nitrogen. So when I pour liquid nitrogen onto the hot floor, it boils and you're seeing it boil up. And the cloud that you see is water vapor condensing out of the air, making a cloud because the nitrogen is so cold. But it's so cold com that compared to it, the floor is so hot that it makes it boil. Well, if you've got something that cold, then it seems perfectly reasonable that if you want to cool down a gas to make the atoms and molecules move more, more slowly, then let's try to cool it with something like that. So here's a traditional container for hot gas. And I'm gonna stuff it into this bait bucket that is filled with liquid nitrogen to cool it down. Because, you know, if we can cool it down, then we can uh, make the atoms and molecules move more slowly. And if they move more slowly, it'll be easier to make measurements on them. I think that kids are curious about everything, and science is an ideal way of both uh, exploring and satisfying curiosity. Because in science, you can be curious about things, and you can often find answers. So I think that that really feeds into the, the natural inclination of children to be curious about the way things work. I think some of you may have noticed that there was something fishy going on here. That I was able to put more balloons in here than there was room for. And that's because these balloons are now as flat as pancakes. They're like frisbees. When you play with actual uh, toys that are physical toys, then they're constrained by the laws of nature. And those laws of nature are, are just amazing. And so I think that playing with, with physical objects is an important thing for people to develop uh, a curiosity about nature, but also an intuition about the way things should work. Remember how nice and, and uh, bouncy the racquetball was? <laughs> Shatters like it was made out of China. This stuff, this stuff is really, really cold. They play with magnets and they think, how can it be that I can push on something without touching it? And if they ask themselves questions like that, then they may become interested enough in science that they want to pursue uh, a career in science. So if I hold it right here, it should just float because I've got just enough force pushing it up to keep it from falling. So if I let go of this thing, it should just float. And when I let go of it, it doesn't float because it turns over and gets attracted to the big magnet. So it never works. If you try to make one magnet float above another, it just never works. But you learn something else playing with toys, and that is that if you spin a top, the top will not fall over. And it turns out that our atoms are not just like little magnets, they're like little spinning magnets. So I'm spinning the thing, and now it floats. A lot of people ask me, well, what was it like when you discovered that you were cooling things down to lower uh, than the temperatures that people thought was possible to cool things with lasers? Because, you know, laser cooling started off as a theoretical idea, and people calculated how cold you could get things, and then people started to do the experiments, and then, after doing enough experiments, we found out, oh wow, it's a lot colder. What we do is we shine in laser beams on our gas of atoms. This is a gas of sodium atoms, the kind of atoms that are in these yellow street lamps. And that's why this is yellow. And we shine in laser beams from all different directions. And right here, we accumulate a cloud of atoms. There's about 100 million atoms here, and it's about a centimeter across. And the question is, how cold 
are these atoms? Well, to give you an impression of how cold these atoms are, I want to remind you of this thermometer that has room temperature up here and zero, the coldest possible temperature down here, 77 degrees. Look how cold 77 degrees is on here. I mean, it's so cold that it boils when you pour it out on the ground. It's just, it's just amazing. At the beginning of the Renaissance, there was very little that we actually knew about the way the world works, and we've learned a tremendous amount. And that has been as big an adventure as any adventure you can imagine, as any adventure of exploring the western frontier of the United States, of exploring space, finding out the way the world works has been a tremendous adventure. And that's one of the things that I think the science teachers should, should transmit. Uh, it seems that scientists are just uh, children who never grew out of that curiosity.